I'm fine. I'm okay. Fine. Not a problem. Mm -hmm. Sign more space. There. Well, good morning and welcome. I'm Ken Weinstein, president of Hudson Institute. I'd like to welcome everyone, especially our very distinguished panelists this morning, our friends at the American Hellenic Institute as well, for coming to our conference on power shifts in the Eastern Mediterranean, the emerging strategic relationship between Israel, Greece, and Cyprus. I'd like to give a special welcome to our first speakers, the Ambassador of Greece, His Excellency Christos Panagopoulos, the Ambassador of Cyprus, His Excellency George Chakali, the Minister for Economic Affairs of the Israeli Embassy, Ellie Groner, and the Honorable Brad Schneider, the uh, Congressman from the 10th District of Illinois, representing the North Shore suburbs of Chicago, a prominent member of the uh, Hellenic Israel Caucus, and a member of the House Committee on uh, Foreign Affairs. We had expected the former on International Affairs, we had expected the former Chair of the House Committee on International Affairs, Congresswoman Eliana ross uh here this morning. She initially, she had confirmed for the event and actually prepared a speech, but her schedule changed at the last minute and the speech uh, should be uh, distributed uh, to you in the audience. Rather than read it, I would encourage you Rather than read it aloud, I would encourage you to uh, read it. The issue is obviously, the issue we're discussing is obviously of uh, deep interest to uh, Congresswoman uh, Ross Layton in. Now, as politics and alliances in the Eastern Mediterranean shift, the region's security framework is being challenged on a daily basis. As we all know, with uh, today there are virtually no U.S. naval forces in the region, and America seems to have stepped back from its traditional stabilizing role. And this is particularly disturbing as we faced a number of years of turmoil in the Eastern Mediterranean since the beginning of the so-called Arab Spring. The vacuum of authority left by deposed leaders and a weaker U.S. presence has allowed radical Islam, assisted in many cases by America's strategic competitors, to become the region's most dynamic political force. Jihadist groups are now well entrenched in places from Damascus uh, to Tripoli. And as we all know, uh, the Syrian civil war has left over 110,000 dead and more than a million refugees in the region. Now, with U.S. policy increasingly looking towards Asia under the so-called rebalance, uh, this means that our allies in the region uh, are going to have to become even more important to assuring uh, regional stability. And we, we face some challenges, as we all know, with longstanding allies. Under Prime Minister uh, Erdogan, Turkey, once a close U.S. ally, has increasingly turned its back on the West. And we see Russia, Russian, Chinese, and Iranian naval forces increasingly active uh, in the region. Now, against this back backdrop of great challenges and uh, strategic uh, threats, there is a bright spot that uh, we all know about, and that's the, uh, the dynamic changes that are being unleashed through incredible human ingenuity, which has caused the Eastern Mediterranean's hydrocarbon map to be with redrawn. The recent discovery of substantial natural gas fields within the Israeli and Cypriot exclusive economic zones and the selection of the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, which will channel Azeri natural gas to the EU market through Greece, represent the only hydrocarbon reserves under control of pro-Western forces in this challenging region. These new energy corridors, when they come online later this decade, will open new and competitive routes for Europe to import natural gas from producers other than the Rus that, that the Russian state monopoly Gazprom does not control. Adding new energy resources to the market will result, as we all hope, in downward pressure on prices, provide alternatives to Iranian and Middle Eastern energy, and, and consolidate both the Eastern Mediterranean and the Caspian Sea's energy within the European energy framework for the first time in history. In addition, uh, these dramatic and, and important political energy changes are also the basis of a shifting geostrategic uh, relationship in the region, and we're now seeing an important developing strategic relationship between Greece, Israel, and Cyprus, as each state aims to take advantage of their shared economic and security interests. These nations are, of course, the only Western democratic states in the region who share the same values and principles of the United States, and this triangle has the potential to play a much more significant role 
as a pro-democratic force and a force for hope and stability in the Eastern Mediterranean. Now that being said, by way of introduction, I now have the uh, pleasure of introducing my Hudson Institute colleague, Seth Cropsey, who leads our work on the Navy. Uh, to uh, introduce this panel, let me say by way of introduction that Seth is a former Deputy Undersecretary of the Navy, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for uh, Special Operations, and he has written uh, with great authority on U.S. naval issues and has recently published uh, the book uh, Mayday that uh, has received very positive reviews in a wide variety of publications, including the uh, Wall Street Journal and uh, the Weekly Standard, among other publications. I cannot imagine anyone better to help us uh, look at these challenges uh, or to begin our discussion of these challenges more this morning than Seth. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Let me uh, repeat Ken Weinstein's welcome to Hudson Institute this morning. Uh, the discovery of, um, of massive hydrocarbon deposits in the eastern Mediterranean, uh, their potential for brightening the economic futures of Cyprus, Greece, and Israel, uh, the emerging relationship between the three states as well as the U.S. role in promoting this relationship, uh, the security challenges in the region, and what all of these mean for American strategy uh, are the topics of today's conference. We're honored by the presence of an exceptionally distinguished group of speakers today. Uh, in fact, I would prefer to listen to them than to myself. Um, so I will speak as briefly as possible by way of introduction um, in the hope that there will be more time for their remarks and your questions. Um, as Ken Weinstein noted uh, on your chairs, I hope you will have found a fuller bio of, uh, uh, of our speakers. I, I, um, I intended to speak extemporaneously uh, by way of introduction, but for the sake of brevity, I thought I would throw out the extemporaneous presentation and read from a script instead. Um, the first panel today will look at the changing uh, picture in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, these speakers are eminently qualified to do so. Uh, and uh, by the way, we're going to go for the sake of avoiding difficulties in protocol from here to there. <laughs> that will uh, that, that will uh, take care of my venture into protocol this morning, and I hope no one will be offended by it. Um, Congressman Brad Schneider is, uh, represents um, my home state, Illinois' 10th district, uh, and Illinois is possessive. I'm not pronouncing the state. The state is called Illinois. Um, he is a distinguished member of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, as well as a member of the Hellenic Israel Caucus, which performs a valuable service by working to strengthen relations between Greece, Israel, Cyprus, and the United States. Uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, Congressman uh, Ross Leighton is not able to be with us, although uh, I know she wants to be. Um, his Excellency Christos Panagopoulos uh, is Ambassador of Greece to the United States. This is the Ambassador's third posting as his government's senior representative in foreign capitals, responsibilities that no doubt his service with the Hellenic Navy were important in developing. Those of you who know my connection with the Navy will understand what was an attempt at humor in the last sentence. Uh, his Excellency George Chakali, Ambassador of Cyprus to the United States, will continue the discussion uh, or will actually initiate it. Ambassador Chakali has served in the U.S. prior to his current assignment, as well as senior positions in Northern and Central Europe. Um, Ellie Groner, Israel's Minister for Economic Affairs to the United States, um, is also here. Uh, he um, 
he has taken a career path that I hope our own State Department has noted. Uh, Minister Groner came to the diplomatic post after working in business, that is for companies that are expected to show a profit. But as I noted a moment ago, uh, I encourage you to look for greater detail in the bios that we've provided. Um, after the speakers have completed their remarks, there will be time for questions and answers. I will repeat then what I uh, have to say now, and that is we would much appreciate it if when you were recognized from the podium, you would identify yourself by name and organization. And with that, uh, let me turn the floor over to Ambassador Chakali. Thank you, Seth. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to be here and sharing some uh, food for thought with you this morning on a topic that's, I think, very, very interesting. Um, basically, what I'd like to do is just um, focus on how we in Cyprus see the possibilities of creating a more stable and a more prosperous environment in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, through the development of the energy sector, uh, the influence that the energy sector can have on the geopolitics in the region, uh, and on how the implications of this new dimension um, have already created an increased interest in what is going on in our part of the world, um, least of all here in the U.S., um, very simply put, um, energy dependence on suppliers which are in a highly sensitive political geostrategic transition like Egypt, Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, but also on Russia, um, is causing many countries, not only in Europe but also in, in Asia and beyond, to look for alternative, more stable and less expensive sources to satisfy their energy requirements. Um, these countries are now looking towards new potential energy suppliers like Israel, like Cyprus and Greece for their energy needs. Uh, just to give you some brief background, uh, we've been aware of hydrocarbon deposits in our subsea for several years. Um, and in order to allow exploration and exploitation, Cyprus has been pursuing the conclusion of easy delimitation and cooperation agreements with all the coastal states with which we share sea boundaries. Um, the delimitation agreements we've already concluded with Israel, Egypt, and Lebanon have established not only the sea boundaries between Cyprus and our three neighboring states, but they are also considered as the boundaries between the European Union and the Middle East. Um, these agreements provide legal security to all states concerned. They promote cooperation, both bilaterally and regionally, and also provide the necessary legal framework for international oil and gas companies to pursue exploration and exploitation of the hydrocarbons. The strategic cooperation between Cyprus, Israel, and Greece, um, the only three stable democracies in the Eastern Mediterranean, by the way, um, could in our mind be an excellent guarantee not only for security of energy supply, but also for stability and prosperity. In addition to the findings by the Texas-based Noble Energy in Exploration Block 12 of Cyprus's EZ, which is adjacent to the large deposits in Israel's EZ, uh, let me add here that the Italian energy company ENI um, and the French Total have already been given licenses for exploration in other blocks of Cyprus's EZ, where there seem to be very, very varied reasons for optimism. Um, Cyprus has already announced its intention to build an LNG plant at Vasilikos, which is in the southern coast of the island, with a view to turning Cyprus into an energy hub for the region. Um, the final choice that Israel will make concerning the method of exporting its own resources and the choice of route for those exports uh, will also have profound economic and geopolitical repercussions uh, for the area. Uh, there's also on the table the plan for the creation of an electricity cable, uh, what's known as the EuroAsia Interconnector, uh, which is a proposed power grid interconnector starting from Israel through Cyprus and into Greece uh, via the world's longest submarine power cable, over 620 miles long, providing a connection through Greece to the pan-European electricity grid. 
Uh, this trilateral cooperation is progressing at a very quick and a very steady pace. An MOU was recently signed by the energy ministers of the three countries in Cyprus, um, highlighting the intention to start joint development projects in the energy sector and promoting a sustainable energy source uh, supply. This cooperation will extend in the fields of renewable energy sources, electricity power generation, and sustainable water supply. Uh, but this also opens up new areas of cooperation between our countries, covering such sectors as search and rescue, defense and security, counterterrorism, illegal migration, uh, non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and the like. Um, it will also create synergies in maritime security, food security, and water management, and will generate investment and business opportunities. Now, we see this whole process as an opportunity for transforming the Eastern Mediterranean into an area of common borders and shared interests for all of us out there. Uh, much like the cooperation in the coal and steel sectors in Europe through the European Coal and Steel Community, which was the precursor, as everybody knows, of today's European Union. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the prospect of joint hydrocarbons exploration has a huge impact on the geopolitics of our region. So it's our responsibility to see how best to use this gift that we have for the benefit of all the people in the region. It's not only an opportunity in our eyes for economic development, it's also part of a joint effort to work in good faith to create stability in a region that is very sensitive and very volatile. Uh, so to conclude, and I can cover any gaps uh, that uh, you think there are through your questions, um, in our efforts to create a safer and a more prosperous future for our citizens, we are proceeding to take advantage of our resources in a peaceful and a constructive manner in accordance with international legality. We hope that all our other neighbors in the region will take example uh, and that they will see these developments in the same way so that we can have uh, a joint effort of all the countries in the region for this common quest to create an area of peace, of security, of prosperity and stability. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Chikali. Uh, Ambassador Panagopoulos. Next. Please. Do you mind if I stay here? Not at I've all. I've been in the Navy, but I'm aging now. Thank you. Thank you it's, it's so very much. for. Here. Uh, yeah, that's better, <laughs> if it's all right with you. First of all, I'd like to extend my warmest thanks for the Hudson Institute, this distinguished academic uh, institution. Uh, yeah for hosting us today to exchange views. Uh, probably I should go over there. Huh? Sorry about this. Yeah. Okay. Work. So I was just thanking you and the Hudson Institute for providing us uh, uh, the venue to exchange views on a very important, uh, what it seems and it looks a very promising uh, morning and afternoon because we're, we're going to continue with two more panels as I understand it and uh, I'm grateful to my colleagues and also to the congressman who took the time uh, being a ranking member of the Hellenic Israeli caucus and uh, uh, a note of less importance a distinguished member of the foreign affairs uh, committee of the congress to be with us today Ladies and gentlemen, the Eastern Mediterranean Basin is currently witnessing major shifts of great geopolitical importance. Many significant developments are taking place in a wider, tumultuous region, which offers both challenges and opportunities at the same time. The volatile and unpredictable political environment might be breeding ground for potential threats. Certain new developments, however, offer promising possibilities. Now, on the side of challenges and threats, let's say, I can offer you uh, the very acute and, I would say, explosive issue of uncontrolled immigration. 
Only yesterday my Prime Minister took the initiative in view of our forthcoming presidency of the European Union to visit our partners in the European Union, the Prime Minister of Malta, Prime Minister of Italy, that took place only yesterday, to raise again the issue of illegal immigration. We know that because of the uh, situation created in this part, in the southern border, let's say, of the European Union, the issue of illegal immigration is becoming a very acute one. And it's not an issue of one country or two countries. It's a pan-European, I would say, a common issue of our Western community. That's why, apart from that initiative, yesterday's initiative, where he had the chance to discuss this with his colleagues from Malta and Italy, uh, my Prime Minister, during his last visit here in the United States, back in August with President Obama, and three weeks ago with Vice President uh, uh, Biden, he had the chance to raise the issue, and the response from the highest levels of the administration was very positive. As a matter of fact, we do expect uh, pretty soon to realize a visit of high-level commission from Greece in order to materialize uh, the assistance that was promised from uh, uh, the United States. That's on the part of challenges. But uh, in this fluid region, I would like to say that Greece has always been a reliable security provider and a strong factor of stability offering to friends and allies the comfort of a stable anchor. This remains the case notwithstanding the financial and economic crisis that I bet you are all aware that Greece has been going through in the last few years. The prospects of recovery are already, already within reach and they do not affect at all the role of my country as a net security provider to the region. To the contrary, so I'm here today to offer you our point of view and talk a little about important synergies that are emerging among the three natural partners in this part of the world, that is Greece, Cyprus, and Israel. And I call us natural partners because Elins and Jews, these two historic peoples, have marked indelibly the foundations of the Western civilization. Let us recall that Greece, Cyprus, and Israel as it was mentioned before, are all solid, fully-fledged Western-type democracies in a region where democracy is not, unfortunately, in abundance in our days. In the last few years, the relations between Greece and Israel are getting deeper and stronger. Uh, investing in continuity and pursuing common goals and objectives, just recently, in early October, the first high-level meeting of the Israeli and Greek governments what we call G2G, government to government, headed by Premier Samaras and Netanyahu, who was held in Israel. Energy, a few sectors that we uh, touch upon were energy, agriculture investment, tourism, culture and defense, just to name a few were the sectors explored for further cooperation. Furthermore, the three countries Greece, Israel, and Cyprus have also been blessed with important offshore natural resources, resources they need to be explored, developed, and eventually head to the markets. Energy is fast becoming one of the main areas of our even ever stronger cooperation. The resources of the three countries can potentially address three sets of concerns in Europe. They can provide for environmentally friendly energy, they can provide for cheap energy, and they can provide for energy diversification, an issue very important to our American allies. The new emerging reality has compelled the European Union to advocate the concept of the so-called the East Med Corridor Strategy. My uh, dear colleague, Abbas Sakalis, just touched upon this. So the East Med Corridor strategy, which, by the way, the two upcoming Greek and Italian European Union presidencies will spare no effort to further promote. And that was a special topic for yesterday's summit between Prime Minister Samaras and Letta. It is within this strategy that the European uh, Commission recent, uh, recently adopted a number of infrastructure projects, such as the Euro-Asia Interconnector, 
underwater electric cable link in Israel, Cyprus and Greece, the liquid natural gas storage facility in Cyprus, and gas pipeline to link Israeli and Cypriot offshore fields to Greece's mainland. Greece is already hard to, at work to explore its own energy resources as a matter of priority. Currently, exploratory drilling is to be undertaken in three promising areas, Ioannina, Katakolo, and the Gulf of Patras, in 2014 or early 2015 at the latest. Apart from these three areas, Greece is engaged in a massive seismic survey program of its continental shelf that covers an area of 220,000 square kilometers. Indeed, the preliminary analysis of the data so far acquired indicates that the existence of a multitude of promising target areas in the Ionian Sea west of our mainland and the sea to the south of Crete. Further, more recently, two corporations showed interest in conducting research of hydrocarbons in the Thermaikos and Dorfanos Gulfs, those lay in the northern part of my country. Moving away for just a second from energy issues and focusing on broader political considerations, one could say that uh, the three countries, Greek, Greece, Israel and Cyprus, have come to know how to achieve and sustain stability for they appreciate its value. They also understand that stability can offer synergies. Moreover, they know very well that there is no freedom without security, as there is no peace without justice. In the very same manner, there is no prosperity without peace and stability. All three of them share common values, freedom, justice and prosperity as pillars of democracy and security. A world of opportunities is opening up for the region. For instance, imagine the multiplying effect, the possible benefits for the United States and its long-term interests should these three, three countries be able to combine and coordinate their efforts, achieving their full potential in the near future. Throughout its history, the United States always had the ambition to become the beacon of hope for the rest of the world, for peoples and countries aspiring to freedom independence and democracy. Today in our third world we also need regional beacons of hope. This can definitely be the case for the Eastern Mediterranean where it seems that we need as many beacons of hope as possible. Let us not forget that the notion to emulate the fall of a paradigm was embedded in the works of great ancient Greek thinkers from Homer to Socrates. With the help of those local beacons of hope other people in our region currently fighting against extremism, fanaticism and deprivation will feel encouraged indeed. Freedom, justice and democracy can bring people together, transcending country borders and civilizations, especially in trap regions where they are needed most. In concluding, next January Greece will assume the six month presidency of the European rotating presidency of the European Council at the European Union and is getting ready to work hard to further enhance and support the stability of the Eastern Mediterranean in which both the United States and the European Union have a large stake. We stand ready to play an important role and act as a link or if you wish as a catalyst for change. I can assure you that more than ever Greece is fully aware of the need to continue to do its utmost for peace, stability and prosperity in our neighborhood. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Minister Cron. So, Seth, you said earlier that we were going to go from right to left. Yes. I've been here for 20 minutes. I'm already violating protocol. <laughs> <laughs> well, some say that's what it's there for. <laughs> I can always say I didn't grow up in the diplomatic corps. So. <clears throat> First of all, thank you very much, Seth and Ken, and everyone here at the Hudson Institute for, uh, A, hosting this uh, important day, and B, inviting me to sit on this 
uh, distinguished panel. It's very much appreciated. It's at events like this that I think about a uh, recycled old joke that refers to one of Israel's uh, great historical leaders, Moses. And the story goes, for those of you that haven't heard it, that Moses has coined one of the world's greatest geologists and worst navigators. <laughs> so you've heard this before, obviously. So uh, the greatest geologist because he could extract water from a rock, and the worst navigator because he took the Israelis to the only place in the Middle East without any natural resources. Uh, but it turns out that Moses knew what he was doing all along. Israel is, as you can tell from the title of this session, a Mediterranean country. Its culture has linkages not just to the Middle East, but to Europe as well. And as a result, there are natural connections and relationships between Israel, Greece, and Cyprus. Relationships that carry historical meaning, cultural tradition, and strategic importance. Dare I say increasing strategic importance. Now this natural covenant should not and does not come at the expense of any of our existing relationships independent of each other. And these relationships manifest themselves in commercial partnerships, shared values, not the least of which is the fight against terrorism, and tightening diplomatic relationships. Now, for those of you that have been following, it's easy to get a bit frustrated over the seemingly endless debates, as we were discussing earlier, uh, as to how to deploy the gas. And the government of Israel has been exceptionally deliberate when it comes to finding the right balance between local consumption and exports. Some would say that we've been excessively deliberate. But as we discussed offstage, it's not every decade that an opportunity like this comes along. I've been in government, as you mentioned earlier, Seth, for a couple years now, and I find that one of the most overused phrases, if not the most overused phrase, is game changer, quote unquote, game changer. But this really is a game changer. And the impact on Israel cannot be overstated. By way of analogy, we see how difficult and how challenging it's been for the great beacon of light you referred to, the United States of America, to put together a budget or even a continuing resolution. My friends, the impact of these natural gas findings on Israel proportionally is the equivalent of at least three budgets. So you can understand that the stakes are high. Now, for those of you that are concerned over what exactly will get exported, rest assured that we are very much aware that the most critical thing to do is to ensure a market. And we will ensure that there is a market. There are a variety of export options and a surprisingly intriguing diversity of uses for local consumption. Now these gas discoveries provide energy independence to Israel, but they will have impact on Greece and Cyprus as well. My colleagues, dare I say my friends, this is not a zero-sum game. I'm here to tell my Mediterranean colleagues that this is a burgeoning partnership that everyone can benefit from. And I'm here to tell my American friends that we are all part of an American alliance that's based primarily on shared values. U.S. involvement could be very important here on a number of fronts, and it is very, I can't overestimate, it is very important to us that U.S. interests be protected, and they will be. It is very important to us 
that the Israel-Greece-Cyprus relationship be strengthened. And it will be. Because while politics makes for occasionally strange bedfellows, commercial relationships make for lasting partnerships. And when you have shared values, aligned interests, and commercial relationships, the possibilities are truly as numerous as the grains of salt in the Mediterranean. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Minister Groner. Um, Congressman Schneider. Seth, thank you, and uh, good morning. Can everyone hear me in the back? So um, it, it is really an incredible honor for me to be here, to be on, on <laughs> such a, an esteemed panel, have the opportunity to speak um, with the H Hudson Institute. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, I am probably the, the newest to protocol. I, I've been in Congress since January, so uh, a little over nine months, uh, but uh, not new to this issue. And what I'd like to do is try to bring some context or put it all in a summary. Uh, you know, going first, it's always easy to say something uh, that might, might be seen as inspired. Going last, it's always the risk of being redundant. So I, I don't want to do that. But the Mediterranean has been called by many history's most talked about sea. It's where civilization has interacted and competed for over 3,000 years. It is known as the cradle of democracy, rightly so. It's the cradle of religions. It's a region of empires, and for 3,000 years it has been a contentious but also critical trade route. The ancient Greeks and Israelites used it as, for trade. The Venetians and Genoese, the early United States, and today the Suez Canal is that critical link between Europe and the Far East. It's crossroads and borders as well. It is the space where East meets West. It is the dividing line between North and South. As mentioned earlier, it's where the EU meets the Middle East. And it is, in many ways, the seam between Islam and Christianity and Judaism. Today, the region is fraught along many of these lines and an area, in many ways, uh, facing critical conflicts. We see in Egypt the line between the military and the Muslim brothers. In Lebanon and Syria, where, as was already noted, there have been over 110,000 people killed, over a million refugees, and internally, internally displaced counts upward of two to three million people. Every day, Israel faced threats from Hezbollah and, and Hamas, let alone other threats in the region. And Turkey, once a reliable ally, has started to lean away from the West. And this does not even touch on the economic challenges in the, re in the region. But with all that, the, the Mediterranean continues to be a bright spot because of the issue we're talking about today. There are many reasons for hope, and there continue to be what was called earlier a source of natural partnerships. Israel, Greece, and Cyprus are forging a new allegiance, a new alliance within the Mediterranean. And this natural partnership has the potential to be potential to become an arc of stability in a sea of instability. It has the potential to lead to unpre unprecedented stability in the Middle East. We've touched on some of these already today. In the area of energy, we have seen the Euro-Asia interconnector what was identified as the lo longest lo uh, electrical line, underwater electrical line, has the potential to provide 2,000 megawatts of energy to the region, lowering energy costs for all three countries and helping to achieve energy independence. But equally important, this interconnector will create interrelationships, physically, economically, but also on a personal level. The Leviathan gas field, as is noted, truly is a game changer. This natural gas find provides the, in, the, in the exclusive economic zones of Israel and uh, Cyprus has the opportunity to provide energy independence for nations that for so long have been dependent on others for their energy. It's going to change the fortunes radically of all three countries. Economic growth, stability, 
independence, but also, as been, has been noted, a source of a security challenge. The Leviathan field and the new energy opportunities has flared old tensions in the region. Israel, Greece, and Cyprus must remain steadfast in their partnership and their commitments to one another. The entire region can and will benefit from the new sources of energy, but also of necessity must rely upon the new sources of relationship. These partnerships have to be developed towards stability, and this is an area where the United States has a key role to play in this partnership. I like the word as a consultant, and we were talking about uh, two past consultants on the panel, but uh, a word in our business lives we, we used a lot was synergy. The idea of synergies on energy, on the gas fields, on the natural gas uh, storage depot, uh, liquid natural gas, within this arc of stability can't be overstated. On the boundaries of the world's most dangerous region, the alliance strengthens security and stability for the Mediterranean, for the Middle East, and for the United States. This border security is another issue that we need to focus on. It is a hot topic here in the United States, but it is no less a critical issue in the Mediterranean. And the role that Greece plays, I believe, has the largest uh, um, coastline. coastline, but also the largest merchant marine as well. The role they can play in securing that north-south border cannot be overstated as well. Greece is playing a leading role in proliferation issues in the decades-old decade -old proliferation security initiative, which is a key tool to battling proliferation of weapons of mass destruction on the high seas. Without Greece, without their merchant marine, this initiative doesn't stand a chance of being effective. And as war continues to wage in Syria, we have to be extraordinarily mindful that the border and security and the co on the coastlines of Greece are important to protecting the, the security of the entire European continent. So as the United States reprioritizes our engagements in the Middle East, Israel, Greece, and Cyprus will become ever more critical. Through defense cooperation and intelligence sharing, they will counter, they will help us counter the threats of Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, and Syria. Cyprus' interest in joining and assisting NATO could bring even more stability to this region. Let me be clear, though. These relationships will be no panacea. Israel can't unilaterally rescue Greece and Cyprus from their economic problems any more than Greece and Cyprus can alone protect Israel from her existential threats. The United States must be a part of it. But together, all of us, together we can help make the world a safer, more secure, and more prosperous, prosperous place centering on the Mediterranean. I liked what you said, uh, Ambassador, about freedom, justice, and prosperity. And together, we can work towards all of those. I am confident that the much improved relations among these three countries is a sign of greater cooperation and stability still to come. I believe, as was said, that these countries will be beacons of hope, that they will be agents for change. Here at home, in the United States, we must continue fostering and supporting these diplomatic relationships. We are have, has, have historically been strong supporters of Greece, Cyprus, and Israel. I am proud to be one of the leading members and early members of the Congressional Hellenic Israel Alliance. It is a relationship that we know is important, that my colleagues know is important, and that's why it is playing such a critical role in this Congress. Through the alliance, we hope to highlight how the relationships between Israel, Greece, and Cyprus, and the United States will be critical to maintaining the economic future, the prosperity, and security of the whole region. And with that, I say thank you, and I guess we open to questions. Well, we're almost open for questions, uh, because I, I, I want to ask one myself. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll set the tone here for further questions by identifying myself as Seth Cropsey from the Hudson Institute. Hudson Institute. Um, gentlemen, you've spoken very well, clearly, eloquently, about the relationship between the three countries in the Mediterranean. Uh, Congressman talked about the United States' participation in it. 
Um, what are there any specifics um, that the United States can do to specific actions that the United States can do to foster this relationship, including the participation of the United States? Can you hear me? Uh, I, I think, uh, w without question, there, there's a role for the United States in, in fostering this relationship. Uh, start initially with the Leviathan gas field. Uh, the relationship between the uh, countries in the region uh, and the opportunity for exploration is being supported by uh, Noble Energy in Houston. It is a, a, where, a place where we can um, help exploit the, the uh, natural gas resources and make sure it's done in a, a way that uh, provides security and economic development in the country. I think playing the bridging role, and this is where the alliance um, comes in as well, uh, demonstrating to the world, I'll speak to, uh, in, in my role as a member of Congress, that uh, the United States and the United States Congress is steadfast in its support for these countries in the region because they are beacons of hope, because we share the values of democracy uh, and the uh, values of uh, responsibly developing these resources and sharing them with the region uh, is equally critical. So those are a couple of ways I think we can make that clear. Thank you. I fully agree with this. And I would also suggest that the United States, they are also involved in this uh, on the official level by stating time and again that the countries of the area for the same token, all over the world, they have the right to exploit their natural resources. That's very important because it comes from the United States. And uh, as the Congressman suggested, they're already there uh, on the business level because American <coughs> uh, companies, they do participate. But apart from that, uh, the presence of the United States in this turbulent area of the world is uh, by itself a piece of stability. So they are already there. We are looking forward to expand our cooperation and promote our common agenda. And I have to a footnote. That's not against anyone. Uh, uh, everyone is free to join these four countries. I mean, Greece, Cyprus, Israel, and the United States. We hope that others, they are going to join us uh, in this common agenda we have. Thank you. Okay. And if I may, just a footnote to what um, Christos has just said. I think this is where the U.S. has a very useful role to play, uh, trying to get um, other neighbors in the region uh, on board with what we're trying to do. Um, the international legal order is there. Uh, the framework is there. The goals, I think, are the same for everybody. So I think uh, it's useful if um, a third country like the U.S., which has vital interests out there, uh, we'll try to get everybody on board so that we'll have a, a unified team um, in, the, in the region. I would just add, my colleagues have spoken about the diplomatic role that the U.S. has, and it's not at all insignificant. Seth, you asked earlier about other practical things that can be done. And when I look at the relationship between uh, the countries in the region, between Israel and the U.S., historically it's been based on a number of pillars. We talked more than once about shared values, etc. But an emerging pillar is the economic commercial relationship. And I think for Israel, uh, one of our strengths is that we, we tend to learn new industries quickly. The flip side is that it takes us, uh, there's a big learning curve to go up. And we have literally no upstream industry of which to speak of. And I think that the U.S. can play a very practical role in uh, sharing with us experiences, not just vis-a-vis -vis the, the companies doing the exploration itself, but also about uh, different types of legislation, environmental issues, etc., that are going to be emerging in Israeli legislation as a result of this new industry. All right. Very helpful answers. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let's throw it open to the floor. There are questions, please. Nick Larragak is president of the American Hellenic. If I may, this is more directly uh, directed to you, Congressman. Uh, the neighbor you keep referring to on the panel, we might as well put it what that neighbor is, and that neighbor is Turkey. Uh, in, in the diplomat's case, this country
has caused problems, continues to cause problems for you on, almost on a daily basis. Some capacities. From Aegean, from the Aegean, from Aegean uh, incursions, uh, where Cyprus now 39 years, you have Turkey, a NATO member, occupying Cyprus with what I like to say a NATO army. It's caused problems with security in Israel regarding the operatives that they've had in, uh, in Iran, most recently bringing them you know, to the forefront and other issues. They've threatened potentially regarding the energy exploration off the coast of Cyprus, saying Cyprus does not have a right to explore there, so forth and so on. We can go on and on. Congressman, you are on the Foreign Affairs Committee. How concerned are you, and, and more specifically, and being more specific, regarding the, the actions of Turkey today to the future stability uh, for peace, energy, commerce, and trade, and so forth? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I think as we talk about Turkey, we actually have to look beyond just recent. It's, it's been a 10-year transition uh, within the government of Turkey and, and the uh, um, ascendancy of, of, of Erdogan. Uh, there have been an, a number of inc incidents. The most recently is the exposure of the uh, assets uh, in, in Iran. And uh, I, um, I will confess, I saw the headline, I haven't read the article today, but the United States has suspended a, a sell of uh, uh, UAVs, uh, uh, drones, to Turkey in protest to, to that. Turkey's strategy ha is evolving. And their, their emphasis, if you will, and I mentioned in my remarks, is, is moving from the West increasingly towards uh, the East. And uh, Turkey is a member of NATO. Uh, as a member of NATO, there are certain expectations we should have, our right to have, we, the, the members of NATO, our right to have. And uh, it, I believe, and I'm speaking now for myself, and uh, I, I will voice this as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, we need to convey those expectations and look for Turkey to be a partner for what we talked about of this arc of stability uh, within the region rather than a conduit for uh, threats to it. Please. Thank you. Julia Clonis, Economist de uh, Development Expert. My question has to do with the gas interconnector. Uh, there is, in the plans, there used to be the, an alternative, the Nabucco uh, pipeline. Do you see any potential problems in the future regarding the application of the gas interconnector? Thank you. So, so the que you're talking about the pipeline from uh, 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 there the gas line. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, that uh, probably uh, what you have in mind concerns the Azeri gas. Uh, very recently, the Azeri government opted for what you call the Trans-Adriatic uh, Pipeline, the TAP, as it is called, which uh, goes from Azerbaijan uh, through Turkey to Greece, Albania, and Italy and then it finds its way to the central uh, uh, northern uh, European countries. So that has been dealt with. Uh, of course, it remains to uh, have an agreement, I mean, when it has the uh, connector between Turkey and Azerbaijan. But, uh, I mean, the West Nabucco, as it used to be called, uh, is not an option anymore right now. So we have TAP. Uh, we believe that response to what our American friends, they repeated to all of us, diversification of energy resources, and that, and of course, better prices for the consumer, and uh, uh, energy security. So with the option of the TAP, which is a done deal already, we hope that uh, we provide a good deal of uh, this diversification, if I understood well, I mean, your question. And may I add that uh, the specifics of this question, interesting question, will be addressed 
um, directly by the final panel of the day. So stick around for more on this subject. Next question in, in the back there, please. Uh, Hillel Fradkin of the Hudson Institute. Um, um, I guess I could introduce my question with a uh, an observation. I was uh, noted that uh, there were many references to antiquity uh, and uh, shared values and reminded me of uh, the fact that very early in the history of Christianity, a very famous theologian posed the question, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Uh, after a very long dis discussion, characteristic of theologians, he said, quite a lot. Uh, and it's, it's uh, uh, impressive that today that, that can be said again. Um, but as other panelists uh, have reminded us, there are other cities, capitals that weigh in in these matters. Washington has been referred to. What hasn't, I think, been uh, much uh, talked about is uh, the EU itself. Uh, what do our panelists see uh, the role or p potential problems of the EU considered as a whole in either fostering this relationship, uh, this uh, four-country relationship? Or is the EU really a party to it or, or is it simply uh, along the side? Yeah. Um, well, bearing in mind that the EU is going to be one of the major receptors of, of energy coming from our part of the world, I think it has a, uh, it, its role here is self-evident. Um, in fact, in the Euroasia interconnector, it's funding uh, a major part of this project. Um, so there is a very active involvement and a very active interest on the part of the EU. Um, at the same time, though, um, I'd like to repeat the point I made earlier about the necessity of um, getting the EU a bit more actively involved when it comes to talking to our neighbors about uh, the necessity of working together uh, jointly uh, to take advantage of uh, what we can have from the energy sector. So I think there's, there's a multifaceted um, uh, point of view for the EU here. Uh, and I think the EU is very much aware of its role and it's beginning to start uh, it's beginning to work very much on developing its its active interest um, in the region. Just if I, thank you, George. That was a very good point. And uh, um, as uh, as I mentioned before, uh, as uh, uh, thank you for the point. Yes, can you hear me now? Um, as I mentioned before, Greece, who is assuming the rotating presidency of the European Council, is going to place special emphasis on Eastern Mediterranean. As a matter of fact, uh, probably I was not very well understood, the European Commission just recently adopted uh, three, I wouldn't say mega projects, but very important projects which directly concern the area. Now, politically, the European Union, through Lady Ashton, who represents, according to the new institutions, the European Union is acting as a Secretary of State, if you wish, uh, as a Foreign Minister, is always active on the political level, but also economically. But you have a very good point there. We have to see uh, more European involvement. And it's up to us, the southern partners of the European Union, to take the lead. Yesterday's visit of my prime minister to Rome and Malta was within this uh, great framework. Thank you. We'll have a time for a couple of more questions, but. I see that we're running out of time here, so we have other panels, but please. Uh, I was in the IMF, okay. I was in the IMF uh, meeting, uh, like journalist, and uh, I was uh, talking with, uh, I was in the presentation of Turkey, and we were talking about the implications of a Syria war, uh, the effects of the Syria war in Turkey, and uh, the representative of the IMF told me uh, that uh, the cost to Turkey about all this war by the moment is around three and a half billion dollars. There are about 600,000 Syrians in this moment in the border of, of, of uh, Turkey because, you know, they, they are running away from, from that war. And if we consider also that Egypt is in turmoil, there is no tourism in, in Egypt. There is an, a serious economic problem now going on in Egypt. There is a terrible, terrible situation going on in Syria. 
my question is economic. How do you see all these implications? How do you see all, all these problematics? That there is, uh, there is a problem of an employment. Uh, there is uh, families that are living in the borders, in camps. How is this is going to affect all, the, all, all your region? Especially because it seems that we, we have forgotten the, the Syria situation. And we are in a lot of internal affairs here in the US. But the Syria situation is still there. And this problem is not solved. And, and, and this is a, one, one of the key areas that also we have Egypt there in a very bad, bad situation too, right? Maybe I'll start. Um, what's, what seems like years ago last month, uh, Syria w was top of our headlines. But I can tell you, uh, w without a doubt, Syria hasn't been forgotten. Uh, the impact of refugees, it's not just Turkey. It's Lebanon. It's Jordan. Uh, and uh, I'll leave my, my colleagues to talk about that specifically. But you know, if, if Jordan uh, is, is overwhelmed, Jordan, a country of 8 million people has a million refugees, not just from Syria, but from Iraq and from uh, Libya. Uh, so it is a, a critical issue that uh, we are aware of and are, are talking about uh, uh, substantially. But that's why I think the, the message we're talking about this morning of uh, Greece, Cyprus, Israel, developing these energy resources, creating the economic opportunity, the impact, and, and to the, the last question, you know, why the EU matters. A more prosperous, these, the more prosperous these three countries are, the better it is for the region. The more secure these three countries are, the more secure the overall region becomes. So I think everyone has that, that shared interest. Uh, I don't know what direction Syria is going to take. I, I don't want to even be a, try to prognosticate which, which way it goes. I know the only potential to a positive outcome in Syria is a political outcome in Syria. Uh, we need to do what we can, and I say we, the United States, to help promote and, and try to drive that, that level of an outcome. If we can achieve that, if we can give stability, more stability to Jordan and to Turkey, that is a positive outcome, and then we move forward. But it's something that is, is not forgotten and, and clearly not uh, off the table as we're talking. If I can just add to that. Um, Remember what I mentioned in my presentation about how the European Union started from coal and steel. Um, all the member states uh, just after the war were in a very dire economic straits. Um, Europe was in shambles. Um, basically, this reminds us of what's happening in, in our part of the world. Uh, the economy over there is, is in a mess. Um, so basically, why don't we just try and use a focal point on which we can all work together? Um, and especially on a focal point that has a very, very uh, rich prospect to offer. Uh, and we can build on that, uh, working together in cooperation. And we'll try and build something along the lines of uh, the European coal and steel community, which evolved gradually into the today's European Union. That's the philosophy behind basically our, our effort in, in this part of, of the energy development. We have time for another question. Uh, here in the front. Uh, thank you. Uh, Michael Kutzig, formerly from the US Department of Agriculture. The one country that has not been mentioned is China. And China, of course, the world's largest importer of energy these days. And I wanted to ask Ellie about China's interest in Israel, in fact, whether the proposed railroad from Eilat to Ashdod is really on the table and whether that's going to be built because of the question of the Suez Canal. So I'll answer your question in two points. First of all, I can say emphatically that uh, the Prime Minister of Israel believes strongly in the importance of the high-speed railroad. Um, it's really been part of his vision for a long time, and uh, I happen to share that sentiment. I think that one of the key drivers for economic growth is increasing high-speed transport, etc. Uh, regarding China, yes, we alluded to the various export possibilities when you look at the export dimension of what's going to happen with the natural gas, and clearly uh, liquefied natural gas to Asia, to China, is one of the options uh, that's seriously being considered. Uh, we understand that there's a timeliness to this, um, and it's, it would be judicious of us to act uh, quicker rather than slower. Having said that, there are a lot of uh, 
not only political but economic implications to this uh, to where the gas that does get exported will get exported. There's a strong stream of support, uh, Congressman Schneider, for uh, Jordan, precisely for the reasons you mentioned. So um, everything is is being discussed and everything is on the table. But no one's forgotten about China, if that's your question. Uh, all right. I, I won't be the tough guy. We'll do another question here. One more, but only one. And then you will have a chance to ask other of our contestants, yes. uh, uh, of our panelists, um, these questions, related questions in the future. So, uh, Dr. Papadopoulos, NATO has now three central commands. One in England, I understand it's a naval one. One in Germany, it's the air one. And the, and the one for the ground is in Turkey. Taking in consideration that Turkey is going more and more towards the east and towards Islam and away from the west, was it a rational decision to offer this extremely important NATO command to Turkey instead of Greece? Uh, thank you for the uh, question. Uh, as you know, the uh, decisions in NATO, they by consensus. So there's a, a lot of discussion about this. Uh, Greece has the command in Larissa, uh, as you know. So the rest of the, uh, some of the arrangements that go back to the uh, entrance, if you wish, of Greece and Turkey back in the uh, late uh, 50s into the alliance, the North Atlantic Alliance, some that were recent, uh, dictated but by the economic uh, difficulties and the, necess the necessity to shrink the commands. They couldn't do otherwise. So there's a lot of discussion going on where and uh, what is the threat to define the threat. Uh, but uh, all I can say at this stage publicly is that uh, uh, the result is the outcome of a consensus, which, believe me, it's not very easy to achieve. And uh, I can tell you that the next panel, not to be too much of an advertiser, is going to look at the security issues. So this question is a very live and very real one and will be discussed. Um, I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Minister Groner, uh, Congressman Schneider, Ambassador Panagopoulos, Ambassador Kelly, uh, for their participation in this morning's event. Um, uh, extremely important insights. Um, I think an excellent way to begin this discussion today, uh, and uh, which I hope will continue in the future, and I hope that we'll be able to draw on your expertise in the future as we, as we look at the subject. We'll have a 15-minute break now for whatever refreshment is back there. Um, and if not, then you will refresh yourselves by speaking. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So nice to meet you.